Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning uh, as we discuss uh, smart cities and the uh, prospects of uh, technology uh, in our lives uh, and in our urban environment. Uh, I have a great uh, panel uh, convened for, uh, for you guys here, uh, beginning with uh, Lukas, uh, who has uh, just arrived, I think, from uh, Germany. So uh, thank you so much for being here. He's the founder uh, of a tech holding company called Team Europe and chairman of Volocopter, which is a single place electric helicopter, and uh, is behind Delivery Hero, uh, which just had its IPO, I believe, uh, recently, or the biggest IPO in Germany, apparently, in the past few years. Uh, I also have, uh, on my left, uh, Magnus Olsen, who's the chief experience officer uh, and co-founder of uh, Karim, uh, which is a ride hailing uh, platform. Um, he likes to be referred to as Magnus uh, El Suedi because he's from Sweden. Uh, so <laughs> and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, on your, your right, I have uh, Hamid, who is the Middle East uh, chief executive of ACOM, which is um, perhaps the largest multi-engineering firm in the world that designs, builds, and operates massive infrastructure projects. So, in the beginning, we'd like to maybe discuss the concept of smart cities and, uh, you know, these cities that hold potential promise for us all in improving the quality of life, perhaps, one day. But what are the features of this smart city? We know that it includes personal passenger cars. We know that it includes uh, electronic data collection and perhaps potentially better management of resources. But what are the features of the city? And what are the impact on our cities here in the Middle East where we live? Uh, and is there a risk of a city that becomes smarter uh, starting to lose a sense of community when we interact with each other through online platforms, for instance? Um, but I'd like to begin uh, maybe with posing a general question to the panel. What are the features of a, a smart city? Who'd like to take that question? How about you? <laughs> so, um, first of all, uh, great to be here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so, there's a lot of talk about smart cities, and uh, we, we were chatting uh, in the morning. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, a smart city was probably a city that had water uh, available in the city. And then at some point, a smart city was a city that had electricity uh, in it. Uh, today, maybe a smart city is a city that has uh, internet connectivity uh, or transportation as a service. So I think it's an, it's an evolving topic. I think the ultimate thing uh, in my mind is that all these different technologies that can enable smart cities is, is only, should only be seen as enablers for the ultimate goal, which is to provide quality of life for its residents. Uh, so I think uh, Dubai has said it very well um, with the... Um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, that uh, the goal of, of Smart Dubai, for example, is to build uh, the happiest city in the world. Mm -hmm. right. And this is something, Hamid, that you're also interested in. What is the yeah. concept of a smart city? The ultimate aim, basically, for a smart city is what? The ultimate the goal? Ultimate a, ultimate definitely goal. the happiness of the citizens. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. is the, the, the ultimate, really, mm -hmm. of, of any of the human endeavors that we do should be the happiness of our citizens. Uh, I, I, would, I would add to what Carl was saying is that uh, smart cities is just uh, a new label for an old concept. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just an ev evolution of the city development that's been taking place for centuries, not, not a new thing. Uh, one, is, one probably of the, the, the more uh, distinguishing features of smart cities is enabling citizens to be part of the city planning, the city operation. They have an input, they have a role to play in how their city will function and how they will also uh, influence the, the society as a whole to alter their patterns of behavior, the, their way of life in order to be compatible with these new advantages that technology can provide to them. Big data is really the, the, the heart or the brain behind how we can take advantage of smart cities, and that only became possible in, in recent years, so. Okay, uh, Lukas, I'd like to ask you about your specific uh, uh, product, the, the, the company that you uh, co-founded, 
uh, because it seems that uh, there, there's good news all over the world about the potential of uh, volocopter, the potential of uh, a single manned, uh, you know, helicopter service. Uh, is it safe? <coughs> uh, yes, and it makes cities smarter. You know, like to, to, to answer both questions, yeah, I think like smart cities is the label that we put on cities when they use the latest technologies. And ultimately, cities provide services, infrastructure. And the one that I'm involved in is like a, an, an urban air taxi. So basically to be like one of the first air taxis, um, air taxi services in the world. And the company's uh, name is Volocopter. It's based in uh, close to Frankfurt in, in, in Germany. And um, yeah, we demonstrated already a few flights have been flying in Dubai and um, are working on adding something substantial to the concept of cities. And I think the important thing to, to note here is that like this air taxi service, it's not something in a distant future. Mm -hmm. It's something like that is very close. And uh, so in fact, like Dubai is spearheading that and they want to have like first services as soon as 2020. So like just in a couple of years. And then to the question like, is it safe? Yes, it has to be safe. Mm -hmm. If it's not, if it's not safe, nobody is going to use it. Yeah. So it has to be as safe as a commercial airliner. It's not as safe as small planes. It's not even as safe as a car. Yeah. It's supposed to be safer as a car. Safer like, than cars. Safer than cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the level of risk that we accept in, with cars is mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I'm involved in this aviation industry now since two years, and since then my my perspective mm -hmm. changed. And I remember a, a moment I've been in, uh, in, in Paris, yeah, the uh, Jardin des Tuileries. Mm -hmm. yeah? And who, who knows Paris, Jardin des Tuileries, mm -hmm. you, you stand there and then there's like this very busy road and you stand there as a pedestrian at the edge of the road and the boom, the cars are zipping by. I mean, like someone might lose control, have a seizure, whatever, like looking for a sense for, and, and, you, and, and you're gone, yeah? Mm -hmm. And such a level of risk, we, we learn to accept with cars. We will not accept this. We don't accept this with airliners, and we will certainly not accept it with air taxis. Yeah? And this is why, why Volocopter, it's, it's, it's a very simple product. Yeah? We, we, we make it very simple to make it very safe. And it's not a helicopter. Yeah, it's different than a helicopter. It's a multi-copter, and um, that means it's fully electric. But like from, from, a, from a user's perspective, mm -hmm. it's, first of all, it's quieter, much quieter than a helicopter. Uh, much easier to control and then also much cheaper. So we talk like an order of magnitude, more than 10 times cheaper than a helicopter. That means it's going to be like a service for, for the citizen, not just for authorities, not just for the top 1% or the very affluent rich people, but like a service that, that anybody is going to be able um, to use. Uh, when can we try it? <laughs> <laughs> try it, you can probably like the first when, when, when you can try it as a passenger, maybe as soon as next year. Yeah, the first commercial routes, we're working on it together with RTA in Dubai, like hopefully 220. Yeah, this will be a few demo cases. They will be like as safe as at scale, but they will not be at scale. And the first, like I don't know, where it's really at scale, so you, where you're going to fly like hundreds of thousands passengers a day. I don't know, 222, 223, something like. Like so that. I want to go back to a point that uh, Hamid uh, raised, and this is a question that I will also uh, be asking uh, Magnus, but maybe you can start with it. Uh, why are we starting with these technologies here in Dubai? Why is it, or here in the UAE, why is, and, we, and I want to ask about Karim having been, you know, sort of born here in the UAE. Is it the policy makers? Is it the, the infrastructure? Because we have people from different cities in the region, and um, how, how much coordination is there with the, with the policy makers, with the government? Did they approach you? Did you approach them and say, hey, I want to I start, you know, uh, services of Volocopter here in the UAE? Yeah. How does that relationship work? I mean, like, <clears throat> I think this region here, specifically when it comes to cities, is like, first of all, it's, it's, it's very ambitious, yeah? And then it's also like, to some extent, centrally planned. Or, uh, I mean, Dubai, like, and I'm sorry when I say something wrong. It's yeah? easy to get approvals. It's, it's not easy to get, uh, yes and no. Yeah? They will not compromise on safety or anything. Okay. They have the same standards, but like, it's, it's more or less run like a company where there's like one CEO mm -hmm. who is the Sheikh and mm -hmm. like he, he calls the shots. Mm -hmm. 
when I compare this Mr. to Mr. Sheikh, yeah, you said. <laughs> when I when I compare this to uh, His Highness, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when I when when I compare this to Berlin, for example, they have problem opening an airport and they're closing another airport and and they. And I, I, give, I give you an anecdote. Yeah, it, this this is like something like four years ago. I've been coming in the city center to Berlin Tegel Airport, yeah? And there have been big posters, four years ago, big posters saying like, hey, goodbye, the city airport is going to close. Uh, we had a good time with you, thank you for all the years. And uh, it w it's going to close next week. And you guess what? It's still open, four years later. <laughs> and the other airport that was supposed to open, it's still not open. Why? Nobody understands really. It's fire regulations, something. Ultimately, it's, it's politics, mm -hmm. yeah? And when you've been in Dubai, like, looking for the test site to, to, to test fly the volocopter, mm -hmm. it, it, for me, like, an amazing experience. Like, the, the RTA people would say, like, you, you, you have this eight lanes overpass here, you know what, two, uh, and, uh, and the river below it. Two years ago, there was nothing here. This was, mm -hmm. like, a flat land, flat mm -hmm. surface, flat street. Okay. And then here we had houses, and we, it took mm -hmm. them two years to do all of it. So. They just make it, um, make it happen. So this yeah. is a point we'll come back to in a bit, the point about you know, working in cities that are older, like Cairo and Damascus and elsewhere, and then working in uh, cities in the Gulf that are newer. But I'd like you to also take a, take a stab at this uh, issue, uh, both of you, uh, you, from your point of view, Karim, and from point of view, ACOM, sort of planning these cities. I want to ask about the relationship with the policy makers. How do you, how do you uh, interact? Do you propose things to them? Do they come to you to propose? Uh, for proposals. This relationship is very interesting. I guess I would start by saying that probably the biggest challenge for uh, implementing new technologies and, and doing things different from the traditional way is the stakeholders. You have multiple agencies, especially when you're talking about smart cities. You, you need the collaboration between uh, different government authorities, different uh, utility companies, all of them coming on board and working together to be able to deliver that integrated service in older, more established cities is quite, I think that's part of what uh, uh, was being referred to here by Magnus. So it's, uh, it's these establishments that, that resist the change. But in newer places, in newer cities, I mean, take the Gulf, take Dubai, there is definitely a momentum and, and, and a desire to be uh, leading the pack and, and uh, implementing the newest technologies and so on. And that helps, that, that incentivizes everybody to, to be going in that direction. Uh, obviously, when, when you are working on, an, on a new city, you have a, a blank sheet of paper. I mean, you, you plan the digital uh, connectivity just mm -hmm. like you plan water, sewage, uh, 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 storm drainage, whatever, it, it is just part of the basic necessities mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. That is not true in older cities. They were built when that sort of need didn't exist at that time. Mm -hmm. So you are sort of retrofitting that, but the technology has come mm -hmm. a long way to enable us to be doing that. So instead of running fiber optic, we can have 4G and 5G uh, connectivity without having to dig up the mm -hmm. roads. But mm -hmm. obviously there are some limitations because there is infrastructure that's already underground mm -hmm. that would have to be retrofitted with sensors and you know, get collecting that data that would be required in order to fully integrate the, the city uh, operation. And I think the point that uh, Lukas had mentioned, the sort of uh, the streamlining of the approval uh, process, the, the, the visionary, I know this is cliche because a lot of people talk about this, but the, the, in reality it's true. There's visionary leadership in, in some places here in the region Absolutely. who want to leapfrog, uh, sure. you know, uh, and do not want to wait for, uh, you know, bureaucratic hurdles to delay uh, introduction of technology. Um, I would love to ask you this question, but I'm not sure you can answer it. But which cities in the, in the region, ACOM, and I come back to you uh, uh, right after this, which cities in the region have been demanding sort of the latest technology, the ones that are eager to, to, uh, to introduce new technologies? I'm going to have to say it's Dubai. Dubai, okay. Yes, okay. I, they are definitely very keen, very, very open. In okay. fact, you can go with new ideas and just say, well, I, I have this idea. What, okay. what do you think about it? And After Dubai? Uh, I would say probably Abu Dhabi. After Abu Dhabi? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble here. Okay. okay. Uh, Magnus, uh, thank you for being patient. I have so many questions for you, but why, did Karim, why was Karim born here in the UAE? 
why, why did you guys start in the UAE? Uh, the policymakers, the, the laws, the regulations. Uh, tell us a little bit about introducing this new smart initiative uh, that is Kareem uh, and your experience as much as you can. Sure. Thank you. So um, I guess the primary reason why Kareem was born here and actually in Abu Dhabi is because I was living in Abu Dhabi and I still live in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and um, I, ha I had had a bit of a change of perspective on life uh, after having suffered a brain bleeding that I had recovered from and uh, was looking to do something meaningful with my life. And um, you know, what is meaningful in life uh, if you want to go and start a business? For me, I looked at, uh, we looked at opportunities in healthcare, in education, these things felt meaningful. And then someone came up with the idea that why don't you look at transportation? And at first glance, if you get a second chance in life, transportation does not feel like something that you want to dedicate your life to necessarily. Particularly not when the, the focus was transportation for the business travelers, because that's where we started. Um, so we started transporting um, consultants and bankers and lawyers around in a convenient way across the region. But very quickly we realized that transportation as a core element of, of any city um, it's actually underserved in many parts of the region. Mm -hmm. And it's underserved because uh, I think the UE is definitely quite different from, you know, if we go to Pakistan or Egypt. We have quite some advanced infrastructure here with the metros. I think we have one of the best taxi systems in the world, both in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. But outside of that, um, we don't have that much developed public transport infrastructure. So what we started realizing is that we are actually you know, I, I, I like to describe Karim as we are in the business of crowdsourcing public transport infrastructure. People need to move around. Uh, particularly, uh, it's been particularly challenging for women in the region mm -hmm. uh, for points of safety, uh, convenience, mm -hmm. uh, affordability. And um, when we look at the place like, um, take Saudi Arabia, I think this is probably one of the strongest examples we have. Um, 70-80% of our customers are women and most of them, 80-90% of them, did not use taxis or any other point of service before. Because this they is were, a survey you conducted, yeah, yeah. so they, tell, they told you we never used taxis yeah, before. Yeah, because okay. yeah, they were not comfortable, yeah. so they had to rely on uh, mm -hmm. you know, their male relatives to move around. And enabling access to easy mobility or transportation can enable economic participation and uh, economic growth, right? So in Saudi Arabia, we're working with the government. They're estimating that close to three million Saudi women, three million Saudi women, are not working today, but they would love to work, but they just don't have an easy way to move back mm -hmm. and forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, transportation is not about, we're not in the business of doing a luxury, convenient, you know, in, in the UE, we are a premium service. Mm -hmm. You get in a Lexus and it's nice. But if you go to Pakistan, to Egypt, to Saudi, we're just enabling a very basic way of moving around. Mm -hmm. No one wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I want to transport myself today. No one could care less. No, no, you're going for a means, to, it's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Similar like, uh, you know, electricity is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Internet connectivity is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And I believe that transportation will also mm -hmm. more and more become completely a means to an end, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, what's happening with Kareem is that we are creating uh, job opportunities or income generation, generating opportunities. So we have more than half a million captains that are registered on our platform that are working. And um, many of them are, are seeing opportunities to work part time to make some extra income. And I think this is <clears throat> ultimately, I think this is the promise of, of a smart city that you should use much more of shared resources. Mm -hmm. We don't build multiple highways, like everyone has their own highway, we have shared highways. Mm -hmm. We don't build multiple telecom towers, we use the same telecom. Mm -hmm. Even telecom operators start to share towers. Mm -hmm. Why does everyone need to have their own car? Mm -hmm. It's the big, biggest waste. 90% mm -hmm. 90 90 plus of the time, the car is just parked, right? Mm -hmm. So with technology and the right enablement of the cities, it should give the promise of sharing resources. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there was a point that I wanted you to, to tackle here, um, the regulations, mm. and also uh, the fact that you're a pioneering company. Uh, how, uh, what are the challenges that you faced 
when you started, uh, uh, you know, trying to offer the services in more than what 30, 40 countries between South Asia to, to North Africa. And this is something that I think the guys at Volocopter will face one day: uh, the um, the compartmentalization, the the the, the different uh, laws and regulations, the lack of a unified code, for example. Maybe give us just a, a little bit of history on how you managed to. Uh, to overcome these challenges at the very beginning, because some things that are that you take for granted in Europe and in the in the U.S., you had to build from scratch here, <clears throat> and that is a challenge towards moving towards yeah. a, a, a smart city. Yeah. So um, I wish we were in 30, 40 countries. We're in 15 countries. Yeah. Uh, this is your target. Cities, but your but target yeah, the target really is, is broad. Yeah. So I think maybe two points. One is around regulation, and one is around infrastructure. So on regulation. You know, our industry is new. Uh, we are not considered a transportation company. We don't own any vehicles. Mm -hmm. We don't directly employ our captains, but we work with uh, licensed transportation providers in some countries. And in other countries, we can actually work with the average citizen, you know, provided that he has the right uh, licenses, etc. But over the years, uh, when we started five and a half years ago, uh, there wasn't a regulation for a company like us, you know, because we are not a transportation company, but we are, we are in enabling transportation, we're enabling booking services, so there should be some sort of regulation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think over the years we have seen that uh, in, in Dubai we are now approved and regulated by the RTA in Abu Dhabi, similarly with Transat and Department of Transport. In Saudi Arabia it happened as well, in Jordan it happened the other day. So, Governments are, are, are catching up and, and are providing regulation. And I think having the regulation, of course, is necessary. Uh, and it's helpful to protect uh, citizens uh, and residents. And it makes it easier for us as well. So for example, if we sign up a captain, uh, a new captain in Dubai, regulation says that he needs to work for a licensed limousine company. Mm -hmm. He will have gone through testing and assessment by RTA. So mm -hmm. when he comes to us and presents us his RTA card, mm -hmm. we know that he, mm -hmm. this, this is a good captain. Mm -hmm. He's been assessed, tested, secured, clearance, mm -hmm. and we can onboard him. Mm -hmm. When we work in Pakistan, if we want to onboard a new captain in Pakistan, not only do we do background checks and you know, fingerprints and double check mm -hmm. the documents, we actually go to his village where he's from and we drop a pin on his house and we interview his neighbors and we really wow. do a really, really deep uh, okay. uh, background check ourselves. So again, this is an example of basic things that a smart city th will have the infrastructure providing. Mm -hmm. Unified identification, mm -hmm. you know, knowing who is who, who are mm -hmm. the different actors in the smart city. Mm -hmm. Unified payment systems. Okay, the payment gateway. A so you have different payment gateways yeah. for every country? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So and, the co and the numbers that you call, is it unified? The so, the, the, so the, the back office is that unified of the, all the all the countries, or do you have a back office for the UAE, back office we for Saudi Arabia? So we have uh, we have um, offices in every city where we operate, but uh, of course we're trying to streamline uh, back end operations. But still, this is a city by city game for us. Okay. And the other point about about infrastructure, I think, um, you know, for us to for any entrepreneur when you want to build a service. You would like to innovate on top, and you would like to do as, have life as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. So if I launch a, a business <coughs> in, uh, in Sweden, where I'm from, uh, internet connectivity is very broad and very fast across. So that's easy. I don't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. But if I operate in Pakistan, I need to make sure that I build my application, that it works even if internet disconnects for a bit. Mm -hmm. Over the last two days, Egypt has had tremendous problems with the internet connectivity in the last 24, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So then we need to build an application that can actually work in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of work that, as an entrepreneur, the, the higher the standard the city has, mm -hmm. with all these you know, ICT, payments, identifications, you can focus on innovating on top mm -hmm. as opposed to having to build the whole stack. Okay. Uh, I want to come to, to Hamid, but I, first I want to ask a question to Lukash. Uh, Hamid, I have a ton of questions for you, and then we're going to the audience in, uh, in two, three minutes. Uh, Lukash, what comes first? The volocopters, the, the landing uh, sites? Uh, uh, is it chicken or the egg? Which one starts? Which one, which, how do you sort of preempt this uh, smart city uh, change? <coughs> um. 
volocopter comes first, then comes the landing pad. Okay. I mean, like it, ha it has to be more or less simultaneously, but like to, to really operate it at scale, and we're talking about like 10 of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands passengers a day per city. Okay, so like it's not just a few in between, but like hundreds of thousands per day per city. For that, you need a massive, uh, massive infrastructure, and it's going to be hand in hand, and it's going to evolve gradually. I think Tesla is an interesting comparison here because of like we innovate something, and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, but like Tesla has to compete with existing cars, mm -hmm. so they have to ramp up like all the volume immediately to be competitive. Something like like the, the uh, category of volocopter of air taxis, we, we will be allowed to scale up a little bit more gradually. Although once it's there and safe, um, a lot of cities and regions will want to have it. So it's also going to be a challenge to ramp up simultaneously. I mean, most of us here are familiar with Dubai. Uh, where are we looking at landing sites? Are we looking at uh, a site per region? Is it a site per tower? Is it a, is it a landing pad? Uh, per block of uh, buildings, what are we looking for? I mean, this, I hope to have a discussion with Hamid after this, <laughs> after this panel. But this like, was actually a uh, great meeting between like, them both. If, if I meet like uh, um, developers today, I tell mm -hmm. them about Volocopter, yeah, and, yeah. It's, and again, then I tell them like, hey, it's quiet, yeah, and then okay, it's quiet, because if this changes the game. You don't want a helicopter today unless you're, you don't care for your population, you're in Sao Paulo or whatever, right? Sorry, Paolo, you have your reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but like, it, 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 it's quiet and it's light and it's affordable. This changes the game. And when I talk to developers, it's like, okay, because if today nobody would think about incorporating a helipad in his in his building, yeah? because if it's too little, too much hassle, too little advantage, mm. restrictions. And in the future, this is going to to happen. Yeah, so you will have like like on-demand pads, and then you will have like hubs, and the hub mm. is like a specific specific infrastructure, very like a train station today, a yeah, comparable effort to do a hub. And then like some buildings will have like an on-demand pad or like you will have a garden with, or, or like a country, um, countryside house and this and that. Um, a question to Hamid and then we're going to the audience, so prepare your questions. Hamid, do you advise all these cities uh, and governments in the region uh, on, on sort of smart infrastructure? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this, this process? Is it a, an all-encompassing process or do you go through uh, development by development? Um, what, are they, what are they looking at at this point in time and what should we, looking at, what should we be looking at uh, in order for us to catapult ourselves to the future? I think the government needs to just set the, the, the main parameters, the objectives, to incentivize the private sector, yeah. the uh, individuals to all work towards really building a, a sustainable, efficient, uh, smart uh, communities. Uh, I don't think that the government, because technology is a change. Mm -hmm. So if you try to mandate a certain uh, technology or, or uh, a particular method, that method probably will be obsolete in, in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So you need to just be sticking to the fundamental principles. Like we were saying earlier that smart cities is an old concept that is evolving. So you need to have the found foundation, the, the, the laws, to be just the foundation to build on for all of that. Uh, we've, I mean, AECOM just released a Future of Infrastructure uh, report at the uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the findings of that report was that the industry, I'm talking about the physical infrastructure, industry is not quite there yet in terms of adaptation, in terms of the, the knowledge that is required in order to be able to make the best use of the technologies we've got today. Roads capacity can be tremendously increased mm -hmm. if we can start adapting our thinking and our use of these mm -hmm. facilities to these new technologies. So there is a lot of work still to be done. Probably education is, going, not probably, education is gonna to have to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we are teaching people in engineering today needs to be uh, recognizing the, the changes in technology, changes in the application, that they need to learn new things okay. that haven't been there before. So it, okay. it's really a, a very big subject to be tackled. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I would have a question directly to that, like in terms of like new building materials or new technologies, like is there anything that is like, I don't know, like the 
that is outstanding where you say like this is I mean take take for example highways I mean I think in highways. Sweden yeah highways in Sweden I think they have Volvo I believe have come up with a concept of platooning mm -hmm. which is actually making a caravan of trucks mm -hmm. that travel together so if you can say that the density of cars per lane per kilometer is X by implementing that technology it's going to be 10x. Mm -hmm. uh, that can probably be applied to private vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there are new things. If you can do that, can you imagine you can save lanes that you can reclaim mm -hmm. for the public space mm -hmm. that people can use rather than mm -hmm. vehicles occupying? Mm -hmm. So th there are lots of things to be thought of. But again, uh, we teach our, uh, I mean, I'm an old man now, so we teach our kids in engineering transportation planning in a traditional, uh, mm -hmm. with traditional mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. then, then trans that modern transportation planning needs to be based on these new technologies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. education has needs to, catch to up, evolve. Basically. Exactly, yeah. it's catching okay. up to happen. Thank you. We'll take questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, please uh, raise your hand. And uh, can we have two, a mic here? There's two individuals. Just uh, introduce yourselves, please, and pose your question. Hi, Saud. How are you? Thank you, the very interesting discussion. I want to go back to your, first of all, my name is Fahid al from Tech Invest. I wanted to go back to your question about the cities. You know, Dubai is a great pioneer, it's a thought leader, and it's been doing a great job so far. Uh, Abu Dhabi and, and, and the other UAE cities is also have doing an impressive job. I was looking for something more like, we find ourselves advising and sitting on advisory boards for different cities around the GCC, and, um, we want to know what is it that we can do. I was hoping I can come up with some recommendations or observations to help cities. You know, you said what are the best cities and how do you, what, what is it about Dubai? Is it the municipality? Is it the leadership? Is it the executive office? What is it? How can we replicate that in other cities to, to learn? Of course, the infrastructure and the education, of course, needs to be there. But how do we get cities to actually start adopting these and becoming more efficient adopters? Of, of, of the latest. Thank you. So uh, we'll come to your question uh, as soon as we answer this. I, I think uh, I'd like to take Kuwait uh, as an example in this case. Uh, Kuwait is a, uh, is a, uh, a nation that sort of started developing uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and then uh, it sort of slowed down for a number of reasons. There was, uh, the, there was an invasion, and the, the country is sort of rebuilding itself, and it's a very ambitious country. Um, However, in the past few years, we've noticed there is a, uh, a tendency for major projects to be taken over by the royal court because of some kind of bureaucracy. There's bureaucracy uh, that occurs due to a parliament that's very active, but it could pose hurdles. So that you have the uh, royal court, if I'm not mistaken, the Emiri Diwan, sort of spearheading projects because it can pay for it. It's sort of bulldozing itself th through the bureaucracy. But is this a model? Is this the right model? Uh, can you replicate Dubai uh, uh, elsewhere, or does every city have, have its own uh, uh, way of doing things? Would you like to replicate Dubai in Germany? Or what too are cold, too, too, Germany is too cold. I would go a bit more south. <laughs> <laughs> but what, so what are the, so let's, let's think about uh, the other um, countries in the region here, the Gulf and the Middle East. What would you like to see if you want to introduce your technologies, at least both of you here, my right and left, what do you want to see? Do you want to see streamlining? Do you want to have a one-stop win uh, one window to, to get approvals? I think, like, what do you want? You want an authoritarian? You want authority, centralized? But in the, at the same time, you want a, a rule of law. So the law should be equal for everyone. This is what you want, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you, yeah, I think Singapore, I think, is also a good example for, for that. They have authority, but they also have the rule of law. So this is what I would want. Maybe, maybe, maybe if we go back to the, uh, the small government concept. I mean, the government should be a regulator, should not be an implementer in, in some people's minds. I mean, it, it differs from country to country. And, and the tendency of going to one uh, branch of government and, and trusting them of implementing a lot of projects is a trend that you see around the region right now in, in various countries. Uh, but, the, but the reason for that sometimes is really the lack of confidence in the competence of the various other agencies 
to be able to deliver what they, what they are supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we step back and say, okay, what is government really looking to achieve? Is it looking to actually do the physical uh, uh, development of the various uh, infrastructure elements, or is it really regulating it and letting the private sector take the initiative to, to innovate and, and do things in a more efficient, uh, maybe cost-effective way than otherwise would be done? Magnus, you believe in PPP? Yeah, so to answer your question, I believe um, governments can play a couple of important roles. First of all, you know, they need, to be, they need to be visionary. There is sort of a global competitiveness of, if you have a, a company like uh, Volocopter, where will they deploy their technology first? If you look at autonomous vehicles, where will they deploy the technology first? And cities are competing to, to, to get that technology, right? And so to win, you need to have a visionary leadership and say, this is what we want. And, you know, I think uh, the UE has that visionary leadership. And, you know, where there is to say, when I came to the UE 12 years ago, there was this um, idea that every single house in the UE should have fiber to the home. This was unheard of, it was unbelievable 12 years ago. And they have done it. I think 93% of every single building in the UE, 93% has fiber directly to the home, not to the curb, to the home. Or when um, His Highness in Dubai says that, you know, by 2025, X percent of all vehicles should be autonomous. I mean, so you have the visionary leadership, that's one. The second one is that you need to have the regulatory frameworks and openness to enable these things to happen uh, and, and be very quick to adopt new, new regulatory uh, regimes, whether it is, uh, you know, embracing blockchain, embracing other type of technologies. And then, like you mentioned, I think I really believe in PPP. I don't think that the government will be able to come up with all the innovations themselves. So how do they enable that? And I think you can enable that by creating open standards. And again, if you look at, for example, the framework of Smart Dubai, this is one of the core pillars of, of uh, Smart Dubai, is that they're creating the open data platform where you actually allow, again, entrepreneurs and innovators to innovate on top of a standardized data platform that feeds all the different things coming from the city. So these are some of the elements that I believe that the, the government can do to, to enable and facilitate the, the growth of uh, a smart city. Um, unfortunately, I understand that uh, we're, uh, we're out, of town, uh, out of time, so uh, there's, a, uh, there's a second uh, session starting soon. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Lukas, uh, uh, Hamid, and Magnus uh, for this very interesting and educational uh, session. And uh, you had a question at the, the first table here. You had a question, so please find us and we'll be around. So thank you very much uh, for joining us here. Thank you. <laughs>